This video is an introduction to sequences, series, and convergence. I'm going to begin with infinite sequences, which actually have an interesting origin story. An origin story that begins with the ancient Greek philosopher, Zeno. Zeno wanted to prove that the world was unchanging and that motion was an illusion, and he came up with a couple of thought experiments that are now known as Zeno's paradoxes. I'm about to give you a modified version of one of those paradoxes that I think beautifully introduces the idea of an infinite sequence. It starts with an archer firing an arrow towards a target. Alright, so this arrow has got to make it from the archer to the target. In order to complete the whole journey, it first has to complete half of the journey. So it travels halfway. Alright, and once it's halfway, it has half the distance remaining. But in order to traverse this remaining distance, it has to travel half of that. So half of a half is a quarter, so it travels a quarter of the distance further. And there's a quarter of the distance that still remains. In order to cover that distance, it has to travel half of it first. So it has to travel one-eighth of the distance towards the target. And you can see if I keep on explaining this, we're going to be stuck here forever, because this process of dividing by a half can go on and on and on, without ever stopping. And for Zeno, this was enough to prove to him that the arrow would never make it towards the target. And so the fact that the arrow in flight could never complete its journey meant that nothing in motion could get from A to B because there are an infinite number of steps you have to make along the journey. But you can see how in this way we've ended up with a list of numbers a half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth, one over thirty-two, and so on. And a sequence is just a list of ordered numbers. The ellipsis on the end indicates that the sequence is going to go on forever and ever and ever. And that's what we mean by an infinite sequence. It's impossible to write down every single term in this list of numbers. So now we have our infinite sequence, one of the first things we ought to do is try and define some notation that will give us a better way to talk about this sequence. Each number in the sequence is called a term, and we're first going to start off by giving each term a unique symbol. So the first term is denoted by a1, the second term by a2, the third term by a3, the fourth term by a4, and so on. And this is useful because it allows us to talk about any term we would like without necessarily knowing the value. So we can talk about the hundredth term, which would be a100, without even knowing what the value of a100 is. And going even further, we can talk about an, the nth term, where we haven't even specified what n is yet. n is just a stand-in for any number that we want. Now I said that we're not going to know the value of, say, a100 or an, but in this case we actually can write down a formula for an. We can guess what this formula is by looking up patterns in the numbers that form the sequence. Looking at the denominators, we can see that 4 is 2 times 2, and that 8 is 2 times 4, and that 16 is 2 times 8. So each time, the denominator is getting multiplied by 2. And this can be expressed in terms of powers of 2. So the first term can be written as 1 over 2. The second term can be written as 1 over 2 squared. The third term by 1 over 2 cubed. And the fourth term by 1 over 2 to the 4. Now this pattern is very clear. We can immediately see that the nth term in this sequence is going to have a value of 1 over 2 to the n. But like I said, not all sequences can be expressed so neatly. Now so far our notation has given us a way to refer to every term in the sequence, and also we figured out what the value of that term is going to be. But if we want to talk about the sequence as a whole, we need some way of representing it, and we do that by putting brackets around the term a n. So in this case, this doesn't represent a single term, it represents the whole sequence, so all numbers within the sequence. This symbolic representation of the sequence provides a shorthand for talking about it quickly amongst ourselves. But we can also represent the sequence graphically. We start by drawing a pair of axes. Along the x-axis is a mark for each term in the sequence, the first term, the second term, the third term, and so on. And then the y-axis is going to give us the value of each term. So the first term has a value of one half. The second term has a value of a quarter, the third term has a value of an eighth. And if it wasn't obvious already, you can see that the terms in this sequence are getting closer and closer to zero. And roughly, this is what we mean when we say a sequence converges to zero, that the terms in the sequence are getting closer and closer and closer to that value. But what do we really mean by closer and closer? In mathematics, we need to try and define the things we say unambiguously. So let's see how we're going to do that with convergence. I like to think of the mathematical definition of convergence as playing a game with your friend. And the game goes like this. Your friend picks a small number, which we call epsilon, 
and he challenges you to look at the sequence and find a point in the sequence beyond which every term is going to be less than that value of epsilon. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of this. Suppose your friend picks epsilon equals 1 over 10. We can see from the graph that every term beyond the fourth is less than 1 over 10. So we win this round of the game. And in the next round, your friend picks an even small number, epsilon equals 1 over 100. Now it becomes harder to see where in the sequence our terms become smaller than epsilon. But it looks like it might be from the seventh term onwards. We know that the seventh term is equal to 1 over 2 to the 7, which is 1 over 124, which is indeed less than 1 over 100. And because all the subsequent terms are going to be less than 1 over 124, we know that everything beyond this point is going to be less than epsilon. So we win this round, and your friend can go on and pick an even smaller value of epsilon. If at any point your friend picks a value of epsilon so small that you can't find a term in the sequence beyond which everything is smaller than that value of epsilon, then you've failed, and the sequence doesn't converge. But if you keep playing this game, and you keep winning round after round after round, eventually you might become bored and say to your friend, look, for every value of epsilon you choose, I'm going to be able to find a point in my sequence beyond which every term is smaller than your value of epsilon. In fact, because we have a formula for our sequence, we know exactly when this term comes. I've written down the answer. If you can, work it out for yourself, but don't worry exactly where it comes from. All this means is that no matter what epsilon your friend picks, this formula is going to churn out the term in the sequence beyond which every value is less than epsilon. And this is exactly what we mean when we say a sequence converges to zero. So let's write this out in plain English. I said that for all epsilon greater than zero, so any small epsilon your friend picks, there exists a point in the sequence called n such that for all terms beyond n, the value of the sequence is less than epsilon. Now mathematicians have developed a way to write this sentence more concisely. For all becomes an upside down a, and there exists becomes a backwards e. So that's for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n, which is in the natural numbers. This just means n is a whole number, such that for all little n greater than big N, a n is less than epsilon. So those last two phrases combine to mean for every term beyond big N, the value of the sequence is less than epsilon. This is basically a very concise rule book for the game we play with our friend to determine if a sequence converges to zero or not, except for one slight problem. Suppose now we have a sequence B, where every term in B is the negative of the equivalent term in A. So that's B1 is minus a half, B2 is minus a quarter, B3 is minus an eighth. Drawing the graph of this sequence, we can see that it converges in exactly the same way as A, except it's mirrored in the x-axis because all of the terms are now negative. And because when we play our convergence game, we've restricted our friend to picking values of epsilon that are greater than zero, then no matter what value of epsilon he picks, every single term in our sequence is going to be less than that epsilon. It feels like we're cheating. In order to create a level playing field, we're going to ensure that every term in our sequence is also positive. And when we do that, you can see you're going to get back the original sequence, A. And how do we do it mathematically? Well, we use the modulus function. The modulus does exactly what we want it to do. It takes every negative number and turns it into a positive number, and it leaves the positive numbers the same. So the modulus of B1 is a half, and the modulus of B2 is a quarter. And we can see that the modulus of Bn is just going to be equal to An. We can use this equality to modify our definition of convergence. Now, where we once had an, we're going to replace it with the modulus of bn. And this updated definition of convergence is now going to work for sequences that have negative terms in them. And we can finally say that if this condition is satisfied, then our sequence, in this case bn, converges to zero. So with this definition of convergence to zero, let's get on with explaining what a series is. Now a series is just a fancy way of saying a sum. And an infinite series? Well, that's an infinite sum. And I can think of a good way of producing an infinite sum. That's with the question, how far does the arrow fly in total? So it starts off by travelling half the distance, and then it travels a quarter of the distance, and then an eighth, and then a sixteenth, and so on. And so we want to add up all these terms in order to find out how far the arrow travels in total. 
but we've just been dealing with the sequence of these terms, and we know there are infinitely many of them. So what we're trying to do is add up infinitely many numbers together, and that's clearly impossible to do physically. You couldn't sit with a calculator and do it. So does this question really have any answer at all? And if it does have an answer, what is the value of this sum going to be? Well, in order to solve these problems, we're going to need to go into the mathematics of series, and we start off, just like we did with sequences, by defining some new notation. Luckily, we've already done some of the work. We have a symbolic representation for a half, a quarter, and eight. That's just the first, the second, and the third terms in the sequence, respectively. And we can refer to the entire sum using the Greek symbol sigma. So we want the sum of all the terms a, i, where i is going to range from 1 to infinity. So that means we're summing a1, a2, a3, all the way up through the infinitely many terms. So what's the value of this infinite series? Well, one thing we can do is we can approximate the value by adding up as many of these terms as possible. So let's say we add together 200 terms. That's written using sigma again. Sigma ai, where this time ai is running from 1 all the way up to 200. We can write this concisely as s200. But once we've added 200 terms together, we might as well add one more, because then in theory we'd be closer to the actual value of this infinite sum. So that's going to give us s201. And while we're at it, why not add one more, s202? Can you see what's happening here? We're producing another sequence, a sequence of s. Because each term in the sequence is a part of the infinite sum, we call this a sequence of partial sums. Let's start by looking at the first few terms of this sequence to see if we can spot a pattern. S1 is just a half. S2 is a half plus a quarter, which is three quarters. S3 is going to be a half plus a quarter plus an eighth, which is three quarters plus an eighth, which is seven over eight. S4 is actually 15 over 16. So what do you think Sn is going to be? Can you see the pattern? And let's look at this sequence graphically. S1 is a half, S2 three quarters, S4 seven eighths. Hey, this looks like it's converging, but not to zero, to one. And we only know how to deal with sequences that converge to zero. Is there a way of converting our sequence into one that converges to zero? What if we subtract one from every term? Then a half minus one is minus a half, three quarters minus one is minus a quarter, seven eighths minus one is minus one over eight, and on and on and on. Do you recognise this sequence? This sequence is just b, which is the negative of a, our original sequence. And we know that b converges. Let's write down the condition for b's convergence. This condition is telling us that bn converges to zero, but we've just seen how sn minus 1 is equal to bn. And in exactly the same way where we replaced an with the modulus of bn in the previous formula, now we can replace bn with sn minus 1. This tells us that the sequence Sn minus 1 converges to 0. Equivalently, we can say that the sequence Sn converges to 1. If we want to think about a more general sequence, let's say Cn, which we believe converges to a limit that isn't 1, let's call it capital L, then we just need to apply the same condition, except instead of having Sn minus 1, we're going to need to write Cn minus L. So you can see what we're doing is we're converting the sequence C, which converges to L, into Cn minus L which converges to zero. Let's get back to what we've said about the sequence of partial sums, s. Now we know that sn just stands for the sum of ai, where i goes from 1 all the way up to n. And so when we say that sn converges to 1, that this infinite series, this infinite sum, as n gets larger and larger and larger, approaching infinity, this infinite series becomes closer and closer to 1. So actually we say that in the limit as n goes to infinity, or we can just write the sequence of ai where i is 1 to infinity is equal to 1. And this is precisely what we mean when we say an infinite series is equal to some value. We mean that the sequence of partial sums converges to that value. And is this really surprising? This series was supposed to answer the question, how far does the arrow travel in total? And we added up all of the half journeys that it completed. In fact, we added up infinitely many of them. And the answer we get is 1. That tells us the arrow went from the archer all the way to the target. It went the complete distance. 
so it appears to be some sort of resolution to Zeno's paradox. Even though the arrow has to make infinitely many half journeys, when you add up all these half journeys together, it's actually completed the entire thing. I want to leave you with a question, and that is, if we slightly modify our condition for convergence, so that it now reads, there exists an n member of the whole numbers, such that for all epsilon greater than zero, and for all little n greater than big N, the modulus of an is less than epsilon, then what do you think this means in terms of convergence? Does a sequence that obeys this condition converge? Are there any sequences that obey this condition that don't converge? I think this illustrates the requirement for preciseness in writing things down mathematically. So, if you have any questions, please ask them in the comments below.